right, uh, here we are in our second topic in the psychosocial domain, which is self-identity and personality. So that's what this lecture is going to be about. Now, these three terms sound really similar, and I've got definitions up here, um, but I'll admit they're a bit hard to distinguish based on definitions. Um, self is everything about you everything, your body, your thoughts, your beliefs, um, the way you respond, um, what you're good at and bad at, it's everything. And it's also what we'll focus on is mostly about your awareness of your self and who you are and learning that. Your identity is about what you're committed to, what you're trying to do, what are your values, what are your beliefs, um, what job are you going to have? Um, that's your identity. So it's a smaller scope. And then your personality, it's like your personality traits. Um, how do you respond to people? What are your thoughts and feelings that are somewhat stable and constant across your lifespan? So sounds similar, uh, but we're going to go through each one and some of the major issues in development associated with each. So self, um, it begins, actually, we talked a little bit about it in the last lecture, um, because you have to first, of course, be aware that you are your own independent person. And that's something that you're learning in that first year of life. And you're developing understanding of your self being your own person. So that's self understanding. It's our beliefs about who we are, all of, every part of you. Um, in infancy, one way that we can study this development of self-awareness, self-recognition, and self-understanding is through the Rouge test. And it, I showed you a video of this in the last video lecture. So you can go back and look at that if you want, right? So kids have to develop awareness that they're their own person so that when they look in the mirror, they know it's them, right? That's the recognition. Can they recognize themselves? Um, they're not, that's not a different person in the mirror. That's them. And can they understand who they are? Can they understand all these things? So that's what's developing in infancy. Um, as they get older, age three and up, let's say, um, preschoolers really start to develop beliefs about themselves. Um, and typically, it's kind of fun. Um, preschoolers usually overestimate their abilities and what they know, right? They think they're the fastest and the smartest and the best, um, even when maybe they're not. <laughs> um, but it's pretty cute. Um, in middle childhood, now we're getting into elementary school. And if you think about what's going on in elementary school with Erickson, that's developing that competence, right? Are you feeling inferior sometimes or are you gaining those skills of reading, writing, and math? So kids are being evaluated and they're trying to learn things. And so at this time, their beliefs about themselves and their understanding um, is a bit more realistic. They start to realize, hey, I'm actually really good at math, um, but I'm struggling a bit with the reading part of school. So they're becoming more realistic. They're also making a lot of social comparisons, right? They're looking at their classmates and saying, oh, I'm smarter than him, or why is he so much better than me? Or why is the teacher calling on him more than they're calling on me? Um, and they're starting to develop what we can call uh, their belief about their real self, who they actually are, and their ideal self, right? Maybe they have ideals that they want to be the kindest or the smartest child, um, but they are understanding that they're not always behaving that way. So they're developing this understanding of real versus ideal self. We go into adolescence. Our understanding of ourself just becomes even more complex. So now not only can teenagers recognize maybe um, things that they're good at, things that they're bad at, let's say, or a more realistic version, they can also start to see maybe how other people are viewing them, which could be accurate or inaccurate, but they start to be able to do that um, so they can describe how they see themselves and how others are seeing them. 
Um, along with self-understanding goes self-esteem. And I know I talked a lot about that in the last lecture. Uh, knowing that you're good at something and maybe bad at something else, or you're excelling in one area and not another, um, can certainly affect your self-esteem. Um, and that can be different, that those feelings of um, pride and that you're doing a good job um, can vary depending on whatever the topic is. And in addition to it, someone having a notion of their real self and their ideal self, in adolescence, um, people are also developing an idea of what their possible self might be. Because part of adolescence, let's think back to Erickson again, is developing your identity, which we're going to talk about in this lecture, right? But thinking, who am I going to be when I grow up? What job am I going to have? Am I going to want to have a family? Those are all possible selves. So that's something that adolescents are also developing. In adulthood, so moving from 20 all the way through middle adulthood, start to recognize that you don't have as many possible selves as you used to, right? Um, this is pretty much who I'm going to be. Uh, I'm not going to change my career. I'm not going to, I thought about it. Then I'm like, oh, that's really hard, um, right? You're, you start to evaluate your life. This is this life review, especially in middle adulthood. And think, you know, is this really who I want to be? I had all these ideas in adolescence. Were they good ideas? Did I fulfill them? Should I make changes? Uh, so that's kind of the idea that's going on in adulthood with your notion of self. Okay, now before we leave the concept of self to move to identity, um, there's a lot of terms that all sound similar, so I just wanted to put them out on one slide. So I've been focusing on self-understanding, is, which is our set of beliefs about who we are. We can also talk about our self-esteem or self-worth, right? So that's how we feel about ourselves. Do we feel good about ourselves? Do we feel bad about ourselves? And again, as we get older, we can think, well, I feel good about myself at work, but I feel kind of bad about myself in my family or whatever your situation is. You're also um, developing a self-concept your self-concept is really a list of the facts you know about yourself. Um, you know, I'm this age, I'm married or not, I'm good at these things, I have this job, I'm outgoing, I'm, um, I love new experiences, all these things that you kind of list about yourself. That would be your self-concept. We're also, um, throughout our whole lives, working on self-regulation. Now, in the last lecture, I brought up emotional self-regulation, right? Developing the ability to control your emotions and even your emotional displays. But we can talk about self-regulation um, more broadly. So self-regulation of all of your behaviors, all of your expressions, not just related to emotions. And um, I thought I would highlight a really famous test. It's brought up all the time in the media, I feel like. Um, it's called the Marshmallow Test, and it's on self self-regulation. So let's take a look at this. Of course, I think we're walking commercial. The marshmallow test is a really great way to show how children delay gratification. We tried it out with the four children we've been following since September 2010, Alfie, Millie, Mackay, and Pratvesh. Here's how it works. We had each child on their own sit at the table at a desk with uh, a plate and one marshmallow. They could either choose to eat the marshmallow, the one marshmallow, right then and there, or they could wait until I came back into the room and have two marshmallows. I left them alone in the room for 15 minutes. Take a look. The marshmallow test has been used for decades by psychologists. It's been used with children to predict later academic success, including literacy, SAT scores, and other academic outcomes. There's no definitive answers from the marshmallow test. It's not a matter of passing or failing. 
What we're looking for is whether children can really resist this piece of white candy sitting in front of them that's sweet, that, you know, the smell of it, the allure of the marshmallow. In Pratmesh's case, we really saw this added curiosity because he had never actually tasted a marshmallow before. All of the children managed to show some level of self-control and resist the temptation to eat the whole marshmallow. As you can see from the footage, you can catch a glimpse into children's ability to control their impulses. This ability, which is developed around the time of kindergarten, can be linked to other outcomes later in life. At the end, the marshmallows were in kind of different states. Some had been squished, ripped apart, nibbled around. There was this temptation and there was this impulse to kind of try it out. So, maybe you have heard of the marshmallow test. Um, I feel like it pops up in just kind of news shows and things from time to time. And people have tried to draw links between the ability to really control yourself, the self-regulation, and later success in life. So can you delay gratification? This is hard, right? Even for adults. Um, I got a huge bag of Doritos in the other room and <laughs> I'm not going to lie, I've eaten quite a lot in one sitting, more than I wanted to. Um, Self-regulation. Okay, anyway, uh, another issue kind of in the end of lifespan, older adulthood, that has to do with self-regulation is what's called selective optimization with compensation. That's a mouthful. Essentially, this is related to the fact that older adults, with their self-understanding, realize that they are experiencing some declines in some of their abilities. Um, but because of their knowledge of the world and their own self, they can selectively optimize different components of their skills or even take on new skills or technology to compensate for those losses, um, which is terrific, right? So they've got wisdom, they've got experience, and they can try to use tools to compensate for any declines in maybe processing speed or some physical dexterity or something like that. Okay, let's move on to our second topic of identity. So this is one of our stages in Erickson's theory in adolescence. It's, develop, it's the conflict between developing your sense of identity, who you are, versus identity confusion. And Erickson believed that this experience in adolescence is about figuring out who you are in the fact of what you wanna do when you grow up, your occupation, right? What jobs are you looking at? What are your beliefs? These could be religious beliefs, political beliefs, uh, just beliefs about yourself and the world that you're very committed to. And what is your sexual orientation? Uh, what is your romantic interests in others? So these things are explored in adolescence. Um, certainly, I had a lot of different ideas about my potential occupation. Uh, many people are raised with their parents' religion, and then during adolescence, they start to question it. Is this what I want to continue doing, or I want something else? So, and we'll have a whole lecture on gender and sexuality um, next week. So. These are all, all things that sometimes you are on the right path and other times you're trying things, but they just don't work out. But hopefully by the end of adolescence, you've got a strong sense of identity and you develop the virtue of fidelity, right? You know what you're committed to. Uh, we can look at a very famous identity model, which is by James Marsha, who's from Ohio State. And he um, was really looking at trying to describe the different statuses we might be in with this exploration and understanding of our identity. And so he believed, kind of similar to Erickson's idea, that at any time we may have either the presence or absence of what he called crisis and commitment. So crisis is when you are trying to make a decision, you're exploring your options. It's not a bad crisis, like a traumatic event. Here, crisis just means working on getting information and figuring out what you're gonna do. Commitment is you've made the decision, you're committed, you're down that path. So the easiest thing to do is look at a two by two table where you can say, 
Are you in crisis? Are you researching and exploring ideas? Or are you not exploring or researching ideas? Are you in commitment? You've made that decision? Or have you not made a decision? And so based on this, he believed you could be in one of these four statuses. Uh, identity achievement. This is when, maybe an ideal situation, you've done your research, you've explored your options, and you've made your commitment. Many of you have expressed very strong feelings that you are going to be a nurse. You're going to be a physical therapist. Um, these, this is identity achievement. You know what you want. You've done your homework and you've made your decision. Um, and this is really um, related to positive experiences with parenting, higher self-esteem. Uh, so it's a good state to be in, I hope. Um, okay, then I can look at some of the other ones that you might be in. Um, moratorium. So you're trying to make a decision. You're gathering information, but you just can't decide. You've been looking into all these different things and you're just never making that decision. Now, some college students are in this, right? You're, you're looking at all these different possible career paths. How could you possibly choose? And maybe you know you're gonna make a choice at some point, but you haven't had to fully commit yet. Um, this could also be looking for a place to live. You've been looking at all these apartments. You've been exploring options. What can you afford? Could you have a roommate? All kinds of things, but you're just not making the change. Okay, now um, moratorium is related to anxiety, right? You can imagine, you, you, this is kind of a stressful situation to be in if you're really invested, but you can't make that decision. Okay, um, identity foreclosure. So now you, you are not exploring, you're not investigating, you're not looking at all of your options, you've just made the commitment, really without much investigation. So maybe in some cases, your parents said, you're going to be a nurse, that's it, no question. And you just said, okay, that's what I'm doing. You're paying for school. I'm not even looking at other things. That would be identity foreclosure. Um, and I've heard that somewhat commonly, right? Where a parent has an idea of what their child needs to be doing for an occupation or for their beliefs or their sexual orientation and that is, just what that child's gonna do without without much thought or their religious affiliation even, right? So that would be identity foreclosure. And this is um, can be related with um, what's called an authoritarian parent. We'll get into parenting later in the semester, um, but it's not necessarily the best parenting style, like kind of do what I say, don't ask questions. Um, so this can be related to depression and anxiety potentially. Uh, and then our last one is identity diffusion. So this is someone who just is not really engaged. They're not investigating their options. They're not really motivated to make a commitment. They're just kind of not doing anything. Um, maybe they're still, maybe they're graduating high school and their parents saying, okay, you gotta do something. You gotta get a job or go to college. What are you gonna do? And they're just like, ah, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what I'm gonna do. And they just keep putting it off, putting off the investigation and putting off the commitment. Um, and this is not um, a great place to be in either, uh, especially if they're not able to support themselves. <laughs> so you're not always gonna be in just one of these. You can move around depending on what's going on in your life. And it's been this uh, MAMA, M-A-M-A -A cycle has been described, this movement between moratorium and identity achievement. Back and forth, back and forth, right? You're um, trying to figure out what you wanna do and then you're committed. And maybe that works for even 10 years. And then you're like, I, this isn't, this isn't me. I don't want to do this anymore. I start to go back to moratorium, start investigating, spend time in crisis, and then you make a commitment. Now you're making a change, doing something different. So this is a, a very big um, and popular, uh, well-established model of developing your identity and the different identity statuses that someone could be in. Okay. Uh, we can also talk about how uh, culture and ethnicity 
affect identity. So we can think of the cultural groups that you belong to, that you identify with. How invested in the, that culture are you? Um, in the United States, very generally, <laughs> we have what's called an individualistic culture. And this affects your sense of identity because here in the United States and a lot of Western countries, um, the culture is saying, what do you want? What do you want to do? Who are you? What are your preferences? Make decisions that are good for you. This is very different than a collectivistic culture, which is many other countries in the world who are more about saying, you need to do what's good for your family, good for your community. This is how you fit in our community. Your actions and jobs and, and decisions need to reflect um, valuing and prioritizing the good of the community. That would be a collectivistic society. And you can imagine that this creates a very different um, experience of your identity. Neither one is correct. They're just different ways. I'd also like to point out that in the United States, um, in our education system, we've had a move from the, the 50s and 60s. Um, and before that, um, our education system was focused on what's called a cultural assimilation model. Um, this is saying, okay, if you are different, if you're an immigrant, if you're not part of the majority, we need to culturally assimilate you. So you need to come to school, you need to start dressing like an American, talking like an American, speaking English, doing all the things that are expected in our general um, mainstream culture. This is cultural assimilation. And you can see this if you look back now to older individuals who um, have very Americanized names and um, just look back into your parents and grandparents and their experiences of how they were encouraged to fit in. This is in contrast to what's um, going on now, what's supposed to be going on now, really since the 70s, which is the pluralistic society model, where um, differences and diversity is supposed to be valued and celebrated. And, and you don't have to change your name, your dress, your language. Well, becoming bilingual would be helpful because you need to be able to communicate. Um, but we should value those differences and we should explore them and learn about them instead of trying to just change everyone to fit one mold. Now, you're probably aware this has not always been successful in the United States. In fact, we're still working on this. Um, but that is the model, the pluralistic society model. Also, we can talk more specifically about ethnic identity formation. So this is especially pertinent for people who in the United States who are not white. Um, people of color in the United States, they have to make sense of that. And how does my ethnicity or my race fit into my sense of who I am? And what research shows is that your beliefs about your ethnicity and your feelings about it um, are more positive when you've had uh, a lot of understanding about not only the value of your ethnicity, but understanding what, um, how to make sense of the uh, prejudice and racism that exists around you. So you don't want to have a child internalizing that racism and prejudice about their ethnicity because that leads to low self-esteem and um, really um, negative feelings about their identity. So we want a sense of membership and commitment to the, that ethnicity and understanding that it is valued, even if not everyone around you seems to value it. Uh, for uh, persons of color in the United States, they are taking on what's called a bicultural identity. And for immigrants, even, you're thinking, okay, I belong to more than one culture here. I have my ethnicity and culture that's different from white America, but then I'm also part of America and the American culture. So you're belonging to more than one culture. So balancing this and understanding it uh, is complicated sometimes and it relates to your sense of ethnicity and your identity. To keep going with identity formation, uh, I just wanted to bring up these two great psychologists, um, Kenneth and Mamie Clark. 
Um, th they really were looking at, um, back in the civil rights movement, this um, development of ethnic identity and feelings about your ethnicity in children. So they're developmental psychologists. And the concept of race dissonance is this, um, this conflict in children of color, um, knowing that people have negative feelings about them simply because of their color. And what does that mean for them? Um, do they have negative feelings about themselves based on this or not? There's a very famous uh, study, the, their Kenneth and Mamie Clark's doll study, which came out of Mamie Clark's um, graduate research, looking at how children evaluate dolls based on their skin color. And this is a very old study at this point, but I even saw it floating around on Facebook this week. So I wanted to bring it up. Which Let's see here. I've got it. Okay. All is the black doll. And which one is the white doll? That one. Which doll? is the pretty doll which doll is the nice doll which doll is the bad doll which doll is the nice doll and which doll is the bad doll and, well, and why is that doll pretty because she's white and he has two eyes. Which doll is the ugly doll? Why is that doll ugly? Because he, because he's black. Which doll looks most like you? Like me? Yeah, which one looks like you? And that one. Okay. That doll. Okay, that's hard to watch. Um, and this research has been controversial and, um, and repeated. And the Clarks found that the, these effects of young black children have, having, identifying the white doll as being good and pretty and smart and the black doll as being ugly and not smart and bad, that this was actually worse in children who were in segregated schools. And they both used their research to help support efforts of desegregation in schools. Um, we know that what ha this, you can search doll study psychology and there's tons of YouTube videos on this. And we know that today on repetitions of this, children who are um, living in a more diverse world, uh, the results are not as clear as they were initially. We have a lot more children who are saying they don't really care which, what color the child's, the doll's skin is. Any of them could be pretty, any of them could be smart, uh, but there's still a majority who are identifying white with good and black with bad. And, and this internalization of prejudice affects your sense of identity. Okay, as we move into later lifespan, um, when we get into adulthood and specifically middle adulthood and late adulthood, really middle adulthood is when we start to see um, what's called a midlife review. Now I put midlife crisis up here too because that's what people usually use to describe what's this turmoil, right, in midlife period where someone's, you know, 50 years old and they're like, wait a minute, what have I been doing with my life? Um, I'm divorcing the wife, I'm buying a convertible, and I'm going to date a woman who's 20 years old, right? That's what happens in the movies with a midlife crisis. It's actually pretty rare. It doesn't happen that often, but a midlife review, it does. Um, midlife review is um, getting to the, the notion that in middle adulthood, you start to realize maybe your kids are grown, um, you have more time or whatever's happening, you start to think, man, I, I am not going to live forever. It, did, I, did I make the right choices in my life? I, I still have time. I can go back to school and get a different career. I can change where I live. I can change my activities. This is a midlife review. There's nothing wrong with that at all. And I can relate this all back to, again, Erickson in his stage in middle adulthood, which was generativity 
versus stagnation. This is part of that identity, right? So your generativity is, are you giving back? Are you sharing your knowledge? Are you supporting those younger generations coming after you? Or are you in stagnation? Meaning, are you being more selfish? Just doing what you want to do, um, not helping others. So this all is wrapped up in this midlife review or midlife crisis idea. Okay, our last topic, which is personality. And you had a whole unit on this in Introduction to Psychology. So hopefully you remember that. Um, so we have different types of personality theories. Um, the first two I want to highlight are general uh, categories of personality theories that study changes in personality. And if you remember, you were probably taught that personality remains pretty stable across the lifespan. And, and that is true, right? You start with your temperament and that grows and becomes more complex, becomes your personality, and you are pretty stable throughout the lifespan. However, we can look at how um, as you age, you do change, right? What you're focusing on changes. And the first uh, change theory will be called a normative crisis model. And this is the idea that now, again, norms mean it's happening to mostly everyone. So a normative crisis model would say there's a sequence of very common age-related changes. And your personality changes according to that. Uh, so the most widely used normative crisis model is Erickson's theory of psychosocial development. Right, so you already know that one, eight stages, what you're focusing on, what's important to you, the crisis you're facing at each stage. Uh, and because most of us do, we're infants, we become toddlers, we explore the environment, we have to learn what's good and bad, we go to school, we have to learn skills, right? Sometimes we feel bad about them, then we have to figure out our identity, move into adulthood. So these are all things that would be part of the normative crisis model that most people are experiencing. Our second uh, type of theory is what's called a life events model. So this is saying your personality does change based on how you're responding to unexpected or expected life events, important life events. So while we have a series of norms, like going to kindergarten, getting your driver's license, moving into your first apartment. These all are things that happen at roughly the same time in the United States to two people. However, there are also life events that can happen at any time. How do we respond to them? So um, one that I think I brought up before early in the semester was um, the age I'm at now. My parents are almost 80 and I know at some point they will pass away. That's expected based on my age and their age, I know this is gonna happen. So how I respond to that and how that affects me um, is going to be different than if my parent had passed away when I was seven. Still a parent passing away, but it's happening at a very unexpected time. And it is an important life event. Uh, another one, marriage, right? It's expected, I got, I got married when I was 28. 25, I don't know, whatever. Uh, but it was at a normal time. It was expected. I actually had a lot of friends who had been getting married over the past five years, and I got married at that time too. Um, a friend of mine just recently got married for the very first time, and she was 52 years old. This was a bit unexpected, right? You're not supposed to get married for the first time at 52. It's supposed to be 25 or something. So how that marriage, how getting married is affecting her is pretty different. She's had a lot of adulthood where she's not had to live with anyone or manage a romantic relationship. So this is a huge adjustment for her. Um, it's happening at, a, at an unusual time in our society. So this affects her personality and how she's responding to events. So that's the life events model. Now, there are also personality theories that study stability. And this is what people mostly think of with the study of personality, is studying personality traits. And the most widely used trait model is um, the five-factor model, or the big five, 
or the NELPI. These are all the same thing. This is developed by Costa and McRae. And here are the five dimensions of personality. And you can remember it with the acronym OCEAN, right? So what this theory says is that every individual um, falls somewhere on the dimension for each one of these, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So openness is how open you are to new and different things. How creative are you? Um, I'm not that open. Uh, I mean, I, whatever. It's been a while. I'll send you guys a link actually to the personality uh, survey so you can see where you are in all five of these, right? So if you like to go to new places, try new foods, travel, I like to do that, but I'm not creative at all. So I guess I'm probably somewhere in the middle. It's been a while since I took this test. Conscientiousness is how thoughtful are you? How organized are you? Are you on time? Do you send thank you cards? Do you remember birthdays? Or are you kind of undisciplined, disorganized, late? Mm. Extroversion, most people know this one. How outgoing are you? How social are you? Um, do you like to be around a lot of people socializing or do you prefer more um, activities where you're alone, like an introvert? How agreeable are you, right? Are you getting along with everybody? Are you um, giving everyone the benefit of the doubt? Are you trusting everyone or are you more suspicious? Are you more like, oh, they've got to earn my trust. I'm not just going to give it away. And then how neurotic are you? So neurotic is your emotional stability. And some um, really associate this with anxiety, but really it can be emotional volatility and displays. Are you, are you highly neurotic? Meaning you're more anxious, you're more irritable, um, you're more extreme in, their, in your emotions, or are you low in neuroticism? Meaning you're more calm and stable and less emotional in your displays. So where you are on these five dimensions is pretty stable across the lifespan. However, there's some changes. So some of our research shows that, well, conscientiousness is associated with longevity. So people living longer tend to be higher on conscientiousness. Maybe they don't forget to go to their doctor's appointments. <laughs> They're more organized, more thoughtful, more appreciative. Um, and we can see that in general, as you age, people do tend to become more conscientious and more agreeable, right? They're more kind, more helpful, more trusting. Now, of course, any individual can have experiences that cause them to go the other way. These are just um, averages. And then we also tend to see that over the lifespan, people become less open to new experiences and new things less extroverted, meaning you start to choose more solitary activities, and less neurotic, meaning you become a little bit more calm, less volatile um, in your emotions. Now these are, again, are just averages, um, but those are some differences that we see. I can, I can tell you having children has kind of forced me to become more conscientious, for sure, and it's been a battle. I'm pretty neurotic. <laughs> So, but uh, you, you have to keep your cool, right? When you've got kids who are torturing you. <laughs> okay, that's all for today. Um, and our next, next topic is gender and sexuality for next week.